Now let's travel 6,500 miles across the globe to Netherlands, where Mr. Johan Valinde will share with us on climate adaptation solutions implemented in the Rotterdam city in Netherlands. So Mr. Johan Valinde is a climate adaptation and sustainability expert and is currently the program director for climate adaptation for the city of Rotterdam. He oversees the implementation of Rotterdam Weatherwise Climate Adaptation Plan to prepare the city for severe climate hazards, such as heavy rainfall, flooding, heat waves, and drought. And his expertise is in innovative climate adaptive measures in public spaces where the spaces are scarce. So without further ado, let us now welcome our last speaker, Mr. Johan, to share with us about inland climate adaptation solutions and resilience strategies in Rotterdam. Over to you, Johan. Thank you very much for the introduction, also for the opportunity to tell about uh, our climate adaptation efforts as a city. And uh, let me first share my screen to start the presentation. All right, uh, and I must say I'm also very, very inspired by uh, the, the first two speakers. First about the IPCC report, its uh, motivation to work even more and harder on, uh, on adaptation. Uh, and also uh, the work from Singapore, because Rotterdam and Singapore have a tight relationship for years. And it's always really inspiring uh, to work together because our knowledge exchange goes both ways. I'm always very inspired by the circular uh, water solutions of Singapore, how they, how you integrate water in everything uh, you do because water is really a precious uh, resource uh, for Singapore. So it's, it's really, it motivates me even more also to be here uh, today. Uh, and today I'm going to tell you about our efforts on climate adaptation as a city. Our climate adaptation program is called Rotterdam Weatherwise. It started by the city of Rotterdam, but it's done in close collaboration with the water authorities, uh, drinking water company and social housing corporation, and even the citizens, because we need everyone in climate adaptation in our city. Um, just tell you a little bit about Rotterdam. Rotterdam is a Delta city. So we have a river running through our city. We live next to the, to, to the sea. Um, which is quite nice because it's nice to live next to the water. You can have a port, it's good for the economy, but it also brings some challenges. Getting back to the history of Rotterdam, I think Rotterdam and, and water is really in the DNA uh, of the city. Because in the 13th century, a dam was built in the river Rotter, hence the name Rotterdam. So our sit the name of the city it actually originate from a from a civil engineering structure. So I'm a, I'm a civil engineer, so I quite like that. But from the start uh, uh, of the city, it was already done with water in mind. Uh, looking on the picture on the right, in the in the 19th century, you see that Rotterdam already became a port city, but there was already also a cadel system uh, there, which was used for navigation but also as the first sewer system, because with the tides, all the dirty water got out of the city. So the city was already designed with water in mind, but also from the start, we were already canalizing the water, making room for urbanization. And I think now we really see that it is becoming a problem, but we'll get to that later on. Um, just not some more background on Rotterdam. Rotterdam is the second biggest city in the Netherlands, of course, Amsterdam as a capital city being the biggest city um, uh, of the Netherlands, but we are a very small country. It's only a 45 minute train ride to Amsterdam. Um, and we are the port city. We used to be the biggest, biggest port in the world. Now we are the biggest port of Europe. And that triangle that was the start of our city is now in the circle of this picture. And, and we moved all the way to the sea and also the port gradually moved towards the sea. So first the port was within the city, city center, so to say, but big ships got bigger and bigger and bigger. They couldn't navigate the river anymore. So actually now the, the, the port is in the sea on reclaimed land. Um, and being a Delta city, also we face water challenges from four sides. Um, so the river, um, well, the river that runs through the city is actually a combination of the river Rhine and the river Meuse, mostly Rhine River, but the river is called the New Meuse, which is quite uh, 
uh, well, uh, not so clear. Uh, but when snow starts to melt in the Alps and we have a lot of rainfall upstream, eventually it runs through the city with high river levels every once in a while. If that's combined with western wind, we see parts of our city, the unembanked parts of our city, flood once, twice a year. And actually with climate change, we see that happen more often and more frequently. Of course, the sea can be quite problematic uh, from our city, for our city, uh, because we are now expecting a 120 centimeter sea level rise by 2100. Uh, so that's what's quite a lot. But we have a big storm, storm surge barrier uh, near the sea. When that closes off, the city is totally protected from the influences of the sea at the moment. So with sea level rise, we know that that storm surge barrier is not sufficient anymore and we have to think about other solutions. Well, groundwater, that's really the invisible threat to our city. Um, we see that uh, with longer periods of drought, we see groundwater tables dropping in our city. Uh, and a lot of the houses in the neighborhoods surrounding the city center, those houses are built on wooden poles. And when groundwater table drops, those the foundation uh, becomes dry, it starts to rot and the houses shift. So it's a real problem in the city. And as a homeowner, you are responsible to fix that. And it's an investment of around 70,000 US dollars. So it's quite problematic for a lot of people in the city. Uh, but the biggest threat, I think, at the moment is precipitation, heavy rainfall, because Rotterdam is already low-lying, but it's also for 85% uh, below sea level. So everything that's brown on this picture is above sea level. And what you see is actually also the former port structure. So you see that it's brownish. So that's all plus three meters above mean sea level. And everything that's blue is below low sea level, 85% of the city, most of the people live below sea level, um, and uh, it's up to or minus 6.5 meters, 5.5 uh, meters, still 6.5 meters below sea level, so almost the lowest part of the Netherlands, it's just uh, outside of the boundaries of the city center. Uh, but Rainfall is a real problem. So we are very well protected from the river and the sea by all those dikes and storm surge barriers. But also the rainfall falls on the other side of the dike, of course. Um, we have quite a good drainage system. Um, on most parts, it's the combined sewage system. Uh, and we have around 1,100 pumping stations to pump water to higher grounds and eventually to the wastewater treatment plant before it's discharged into the river. And I have to say, I just heard about uh, the mean annual rainfall in Singapore. In the Netherlands, it's around 850 millimeters a year. So it's a lot less compared to Singapore. Still, our sewage system is designed to cope with 20 millimeter an hour uh, rainfall events. And we see that is a lot of those rain events are increasing, especially in summer, heavy rainfall in a short amount of time. And that's really becoming a threat to our city at the moment. Sewer system cannot cope with it, so we see water on the streets and eventually also uh, in the properties. Um, th this is a map uh, of our city, so we we did a did a did a modeling of of heavy rainfall in our city. We have a three D three D model of the city, also with the sewer system and the groundwater uh, in there, and we can just uh, let it rain and see where water flows through. And all those red dots are properties within the city that have a, a, a probability of flooding in, in case of heavy rainfall. And around 10% of the properties in the private properties in Rotterdam uh, have a risk of flooding. So that's quite a lot. And the thing is, I just mentioned that water is in the DNA of Rotterdam. And also we used to be a water city. This is a picture of years ago. And it really looks like Amsterdam. Uh, this is not Amsterdam, this is Rotterdam. And Rotterdam used to be a water city. Um, and if you think, if you, if you know Rotterdam, uh, I don't think a lot of you have been there, but just to give you an idea, a lot of the main roads in Rotterdam end with the word Singel. And Singel is a Dutch word for canal. Well, I can tell you one thing, on those Singels, there's no water visible anymore because in the beginning of the 20th century, the car, 
came to Rotterdam and our city council said, okay, let's transform Rotterdam from a water city into a car city. So most of the canals in Rotterdam were transformed into roads. Now, this is the Goudse Singel, so the Goudse Canal. Well, no water visible. So it's only pavement, only asphalt. And on a lot of roads and streets in Rotterdam look like this. Well, this is, this is not the best example, uh, but uh, because there are better looking streets, but they are, they are paved. So water cannot go anywhere. Uh, and another problem we are experiencing in the last decades, in the last few years, is also urban heat. Because all those pavement, all those build-up environment heats up during the day and radiates the heat during the night uh, to other buildings. And that's the next threat, because we were always talking about water, water, water. We have to protect our city from water. But now we see also that heat is really becoming a big problem. Our city center and the surrounding uh, neighborhoods really heat up and, and those heat waves becoming longer, more frequent and higher temperatures. Not like Singapore, but again, it is a problem because we are not designed to cope with, with heat. Actually, almost none of the, the, the buildings or houses in, in Rotterdam or the Netherlands have air conditioning. And on this picture, you see the hot areas in the city um, and also the, the, the black dots show the areas of the city with the bad air quality. And this is a new map, we just made it. Uh, and what we did last year, we said to people, okay, during heat waves, don't all buy air conditioning because our city will heat up even more and you, you need a lot of electricity. Make use of natural ventilation. Open up your windows at night uh, to cool down your house. Well, showing this picture, the, the worst air quality is also in the hottest part of Rotterdam. Uh, so that's not the best solution. So we should make sure with adaptation also to cool down the city, making sure the city is livable for everyone in, in Rotterdam. So we have to work towards an adaptive city. And I'm still, uh, well, the, the first presentation is still uh, rushing to my mind. But the thing I take away is that adaptation is still needed in order to make uh, cities in the world uh, livable and how we do that is with our program weather-wise and this picture actually is a, is, is a schematic of how our program works and on the top you see program framework 2030 uh, 2030 is the dot on the horizon for our program in 2030 we shouldn't be needed anymore so what we do is we accelerate uh, climate adaptation and in 2030 Everyone who does something with an impact on the city does it with climate adaptation in mind, so knows what to do. So someone who works for the transportation department for the city, when he or she does something to road maintenance, climate adaptation is linked in and there's also sufficient budget for it. But also for real estate developers, citizens, for everyone. So how do we do it? First of all, uh, we mapped on a really detailed level all those adaptation challenges. And we look specifically at flooding, rainfall, heat, groundwater, land subsidence, and drought. So we made really detailed, level, uh, detailed maps on a city level, but also on a neighborhood level. Um, this is just finished and already translated into English, so I can also send it to you so you can uh, uh, look at uh, the document. It's a, it's a really big, big document. Um, but then you know where the problems will occur. The second step is looking at implementation opportunities because we don't do projects on our own. We link in with that what's going on in the city. And it was already said in the former presentation, it's always about multifunctionality. So that's also the thing with those climate adaptation opportunities. If you link in with something that's going on in, in, in the city, um, you get um, more, yeah, more for your for your dollar, so to say. So what we did is we looked at, looked at new development and Rotterdam is really rapidly growing. A lot is being built. Um, and if you don't do it in the right way, we will all see concrete and more runoff to our sewage system and more problems. So what we do is looking at all the developments and what can we do in order to make it climate proof. And for that, I'm always really motivated by what Singapore does because 
climate adaptive development, I think that is in your face because there's always uh, it, every building in Singapore in my in, in my vision is done in a green and uh, uh, water adaptive way. Existing built environment also really important. A lot of buildings are renovated, uh, have, have flat roofs or paved gardens. Also make sure that those buildings become climate proof. Then the public space. Well, that's easy because that's what we uh, 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 own as a, as a city. A lot of renovation is going on. Can we link climate adaptation to that? Then the track, the rotted hammers. We really also want to motivate the citizens into taking action together with neighbors, together on a neighborhood level. And the last one is linking with other transitions because climate adaptation is not the only transi transition in a city. It's also about the energy transition, mobility transition, biodiversity. Well, all those opportunities, opportunities we, ma we map them also. And if you link the challenges to the opportunities, you can see what you, where, 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 where you can do projects in the near future. So step one and two combined, make sure that we can do projects in, in the city. Uh, and below you see two implementation agendas. Those are based on the political term of our city council. Um, we are now in the implementation agenda of 2022, 2026, uh, and our city council has a strong commitment on climate adaptation. Um, we now have a target to make sure that we build 50 climate adaptive projects before 2026 with a budget of 50, 50 million euros. So that's quite a lot. So let me show you some examples of climate adaptive measures um, um, that are already there. And they are all on different levels in the city. <clears throat> and this is, and it is always about multifunctionality. Uh, and I think this is the biggest one. Uh, this used to be all grassland and farmland, and this is now actually a water storage. It's a water storage that's linked to the surface system, surface water system of the city center or of the city. I already showed you that Rotterdam was transformed from a water city into a car city. So we don't have a lot of surface water in our city, which is quite problematic during heavy rainfall. Where can all the water go to? Um, you want to discharge it to your surface water system. So we look, looked at possible locations. This is one of them. And the funny thing is, it's actually outside of the boundaries of the city. Well, it's really close, it's next to the, to the boundary. Um, but this was the, the location when there was space for water storage. So over here, there's, there's added water storage of 4 million cubic meters of water. Um, and at the same time, it's also an Olympic rowing track. So this is used for rowing competition uh, for sports. So people can enjoy it also when it's not needed as a water storage. But this is one on a, on a big level. Then the, another one is, this is quite invisible. Um, and in the city center, we saw that we needed a lot of parking spaces because still Rotterdam is a car city. So we do also need a place for those cars to be parked. And in the city center, a parking garage was built. Uh, and we already saw, and this was done already 12 years ago, that in the city center, we are experiencing a lot of water on the streets during heavy rainfall, combined sewage overflow. So we really need, needed to do something. So one clever colleague of mine, he said, okay, can we link, can we combine a parking garage with a water storage? So in this, during the design process of the parking garage, the water storage was fit into the, to the design. It's at 10,000 cubic meters of water storage. It's built together, but it's not connected, of course, to the, to the, to the parking garage. And during heavy rainfall, when our sewer system fills up, a gate is opened. Uh, and our water storage fills up. It fills up within 30 minutes, so it's quite a lot of water in a, in a short amount of time. And the storage capacity of the sewer system in, this, in the city center, uh, it adds 50% to that. So it's really beneficial for the city center. Before we built this water storage, we had seven combined sewage overflows a year. And now we have one in every two years. So it's really beneficial to do so. And building a water storage on its own, is, it's a huge investment. It's not feasible at all, but linking it in with something that's already happening, 
then it becomes a feasible solution. Uh, but I don't think any Rotterdammer has ever seen this, uh, this solution is really below the surface. Um, another one that, that is really visible is the concept of the water plazas. Uh, this is the first one. And the thing is that you combine stormwater storage with uh, a, a better looking public space. And also what, what for me was the, 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 the change of mind that we had by uh, doing these projects was really about also working together with the citizens because those water plazas are really designed together with the people living there. We say, okay, we want a water storage, but we ask the citizens, what other functions do you want on this square? So obviously there are three reservoirs over there. They are used for storing 1.6 million liters of stormwater, but they all serve another function because on the top you see a small reservoir and there's a stage because there's a theater school next to this uh, plaza. The, the middle one is quite obvious. That's used for, for, for sports, uh, but also for, for bigger performances from the school because there is also uh, a lot of people can sit there. And one of the on the left is used for skating and BMXing. Um, but for the water perspective, all the water from the surrounding area during a storm event are collected in these three reservoirs. It stays in there for 24 hours. And what happens then is the, 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 the two reservoirs on the left and the right, a gate opens and water flows through a hollow space underneath the parking spaces. And from this hollow space, it can infiltrate into the subsurface. And the big reservoir, all the water is pumped to a canal one kilometer from this water square. So it's really about reducing the stress on our sewer system because those 1.6 million liters of stormwater don't flow through a sewer system anymore. And during rain, you really see all the water flowing. It's also to make it visible to people coming there that we do something with water. Also to, to, to motivate them that action is needed, that we as a city does do something, but that they, they also should do something maybe. Um, and when the weather is good. Yeah, and I think this is not really, uh, I always say in summer, then you can sit in the sun in, in the water plaza. Well, I don't think you do that in Singapore because it's way too hot. But, but in the Netherlands, when there is some sun, we immediately go outside and sit in the sun. Uh, but a lot of people enjoy this water square also for, for just relaxing or, uh, or, or, or having lunch. And those are other ones, uh, the Berkel Square and the Bellamy Square. They look completely different but because, again, they are always designed together with the citizens and every neighborhood has its own needs. So all, also all those squares look completely different and they really fit in a neighborhood. Another really important driver for climate adaptation in Rotterdam is maintenance to the sewer system because we rely on our sewer system to keep the city dry. But at the same time, our city is already low lying, but also sinking. Um, and also our sewage pipe, pipes, they sink in different velocities. So over time, there are gaps in our sewage system, groundwater flows into our sewage system, groundwater tables drop, problematic for all the houses. So we need to renew our sewage pipes every 60 years, which means we have to renew 40 kilometers of sewage pipes every year, which means we open up 40 kilometer of road every year. And that's an opportunity because every time you open up a road, you can think, do we need this road or can we add more green to this road? And on this location in the north of Rotterdam, a lot of problem with heavy rainfall, again, a lot of pavement. And here the sewage system needs to be renewed. And we started a discussion with the citizens and they said, okay, all those parking spaces here, we don't need them because there are not so much cars in our neighborhoods. We want more green. So that's what we did over there. It looked like this. It now looks like this. <clears throat> so it's more like a park and there, there are wadis in there. So small ponds where water can flow through, can infiltrate, uh, reduces again the stress on the sewer system. But this is also a better solution when you think about heat because all those plants over here. Yeah, and it's not Singapore. It takes a lot of time before plants and trees grows, grow in the, in the Netherlands. 
but they will evaporate and also cool down the area and also be a shelter for people living there because when your house heats up, maybe you can find some cooling in the public space. Well, and this is the most extreme form of uh, sewage renewal and adding green to the project because now the, the road is totally given up. But you can do this on smaller scale in every road in the city. And that's where we have budget now. So with every sewage renewal project, we make it into a climate adaptive project. And with 40 kilometers a year, that's quite a lot. Um, and on all those projects I now showed you, we're all about retaining the water, getting rid of the water. And we are now experiencing also more and more droughts in our city. And those droughts are becoming also a problem to our fresh water supply <clears throat> in the future. So again, motivated by Singapore, we should also think about circular ways of uh, working with the water. And that's what we did in this uh, 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 soccer stadium. It's built in a neighborhood with a lot of pavement and there's a soccer pitch that needs a lot of water. So what we do here is we actually harvest the rainwater. We temporarily store it underneath uh, a soccer field for kids outside of the stadium. So there's a hollow space underneath the soccer pitch. Then we clean the water with a halophyte filter. Uh, so then all the pathogens are gone. And then we pump it to the first aquifer, which is around 15 to 30 meters deep in Rotterdam. So, and we fill this descent layer with fresh water and we can pump it up when we need it in, 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 during dry spells or, or, or something like that. Um, well, not all the water you pump in, you can pump out. It's about, it has a 65% efficiency. Uh, but again, you don't use those precious uh, water from the tap in order to irrigate your soccer field. This was the first project. We now have a lot of these around the city, all serving different functions because we are adding a lot of green to our city to make the city attractive, but also cool down the city. But the green also has to straight, stay green during summer because, and now we are also adding those urban water buffers as we call them also to keep the green green in the summer. What's now the next step? And it's a really important step. A lot of the projects I so, showed you were in the public space, but actually the biggest part of the city is private property. And we cannot totally adapt the city by only doing projects in the public space. There's not enough space in the public space because the adaptation is one thing, but we also have those other transitions. So we all really should work together with the private sector, with the private properties, with homeowners, with real estate developers, uh, with social housing corporations. We also need buildings, gardens also to be climate proof. And that's what we're doing at the moment. Um, every building that's that's being built in Rotterdam now has to store a certain rain event on its property. Um, like in Singapore, you are not allowed to just build a concrete building. Uh, and this is a this is this is still artist depression. It's being built at the moment. And what you see is that there's a lot of green. This green can 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 act as a sponge to soak up the water. It evaporates, so it cools down the buildings. But at the same time, it's an attractive space where people can walk and relax. And those green spaces are actually on top of the roofs of those buildings. So in the future, we see more and more green developments in Rotterdam. There will also be a link between public space and private property. So we are really, this is like the Marina Bay of, uh, of Rotterdam. It's now still a port area. It's going to be transformed into a tidal park with a lot of room for, for water and green, but also that all those buildings that are being built around this water are also done in, in, in a climate proof way. And the last thing I want to emphasize that it's really important to work together with the citizens. We put a lot of effort into that, working together with schools, uh, with kids also to make sure that in a fun way, they are also working on climate adaptation, but also with the citizens. And, in, in, in Rotterdam, you are allowed to take a few tiles next to your house out and build small gardens, uh, a facade garden, as we, we call them. Um, and we thought, how can we motivate more people to add facade gardens uh, to, their, to their streets? And we came up with a national championship tile popping. 
it was a battle. The first battle was in 2020 between Rotterdam and Amsterdam, which city could take out the more, most tiles out of his garden or next to his house. It was really in a fun way. Um, first time it was only between Rotterdam and Amsterdam. The second year, 75 cities competed in the Netherlands. And last year, 140 cities competed. So a lot of people are in a fun way making their streets more attractive by adding a little bit of green. But for a lot of people, it's also the first step in climate adaptation and doing more. So, so, so it's really about doing big projects on a large scale, but also really work together with the citizens, with the Rotterdammers in our case, also to motivate them. And working on all, all those skills, I think you, you, you can make your city climate proof. And this is my last slide. I'm also really proud of this, this book we wrote together, Rotterdam and Singapore with the Center for Livable Cities about living with water. And in those book, you can read a lot more on our projects, but also on the governance structure and finance structure um, of climate adaptation in the Netherlands and Rotterdam specifically. So that's about it. Thank you. Uh,